Hello and welcome to this, the first in a short series of programmes about all things spooky in the county of Norfolk. Before we begin, we should perhaps introduce ourselves. My name is Nigel Higgins and my interest in all things paranormal goes back a very long way. I've always had a fascination with the unexplained, the unusual and the frankly quite odd things you can experience. Forming a paranormal group seemed to me to be a great way to study these events and to try and explain them in a rational way. My name is Juliet Smith. I'm one of the newer members of the group. I'm one of the psychic investigators. Together we are both members of Out There Paranormal Research and Investigation and today we find ourselves here at Blickling Hall in Norfolk. In 2007 the National Trust undertook a survey to find the most haunted top 10 properties based on the most activity and sightings. Blickling topped the pole with its collection of lost souls wandering around this magnificent Jacobean mansion and its gardens. The sightings here included Sir John Falstoff, a 15th century knight, who Shakespeare based his Falstoff character on. You can also hear the ghostly groans of Sir Henry Hobart, who died in the house after losing a duel fought here in the grounds. But we are here today to tell you the tale of the most well-travelled ghost in England. So just who is this mysterious spectral traveller? Well, let's go back to the early years of the 16th century and to the building that stood here before this hall was built. Anne spent her early years at Blickling Hall and Hever Castle, along with her younger brother George and older sister Mary. The young girls spent their teenage years in France as ladies-in-waiting to Henry's sister, the French Queen. Later they were to part when Anne was transferred to the court of the new French Queen, Claude, while Mary returned home to become the mistress of Henry himself. Anne arrived back in England when she was about 20 and was immediately placed in the household of Henry's wife, Catherine of Aragon, as the maid of honour. Anne's French manner in both dress sense and attitude charmed many at the English court. Her dark looks were at the time unfashionable and although she was never recognised as a great beauty, her sexual magnetism and the way she captivated those around her is well documented. Indeed, her presence influenced women at court to copy her sartorial style. It was this difference, as well as her wit, intelligence and effervescence, that attracted the king. Henry VIII finally divorced from his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, after declaring himself the head of the church in England and breaking from the Church of Rome. And he secretly married Anne on the 25th of January, 1536. Despite producing a healthy baby girl who would later rise to power as Queen Elizabeth I, Anne's failure to provide a male heir was the beginning of the end of her and her family's streak of good luck. Henry's disaffection caused by her second miscarriage, along with the rumours spread about by the many enemies in the royal court, that she was an adulteress and a witch led to the start of her downfall. Now that the night has fallen, here at Blickling Hall. It's time for us to tell you Anne Boleyn's ghost story. A secret commission including Thomas Cromwell, Anne's father Thomas Boleyn and her uncle the Duke of Norfolk was put forward to inquire into allegations of sexual misconduct and witchcraft by the Queen. Anne is charged with adultery with five men, including her own brother, she is also charged with witchcraft, citing her additional finger and moles as symbols of her being a witch. At her trial, Anne is found guilty and the sentence is death by beheading or to be burnt at the stake. Anne was spared the ignominy of being burnt at the stake and on the 19th of May 1536 she climbs onto a specially erected scaffold at the Tower of London. And with one swift blow, the executioner, brought over from France for the occasion, severs her head from her body. Now, with such a sudden and brutal end to her life, it's not surprising to find that Anne's restless spirit still wanders around some of the more important places in her life. So now let's look at some of the places her restless spirit is said to visit. Our first port of call takes us south to London and an imposing stone structure, home of many towers of horrible happenings. The, the Tower, Tower of London. London. By far most active of the places that Anne allegedly haunts, is the Tower of London, the place of her execution. If ghosts are, as some believe, 
surviving emotional memories typical of one who has died violently, traumatically and tragically, as Anne did, then it is very understandable that some essence of her remains a tower. Anne Boleyn's ghost has been seen in several places around the tower grounds, in the White Tower, in the Queen's House and on the site of the scaffold erected for her execution. Perhaps the most spectacular ghost story relating to Anne is that of a captain of the guard who saw a light flickering in the locked chapel royal late one night. He tried to uncover the source of the light by climbing up a ladder and was met with an unbelievable scene unfolding inside. A procession of knights and ladies dressed in ancient costumes pacing the chapel. Their leader an elegant female whose face he could not see but whose figure resembled that of Anne Boleyn's in portraits he had seen. The procession later disappears. Next on our list, we continue south to Hever Castle in Kent. Anne's ghost is said to appear each Christmas at Hever Castle, her childhood home. Another journey, another castle. This time it's Windsor Castle. Windsor Castle is the largest and oldest occupied castle in the world. Anne Boleyn has been seen standing at the window in the Dean's Cloister at Windsor Castle. Another Windsor ghost story claims that Anne Boleyn has been seen running down a corridor screaming, sometimes clutching a head. And next to a grand house, Hampton Court. Anne's ghost has been seen wandering around Hampton Court wearing a blue or black dress. Some accounts claim she is headless during these manifestations. Our story starts here. We're still down by the lake. Before the National Trust took over the property, it was the home of Lord Lothian. Shortly before the Second World War, his Lordship's butler, Sidney Hancock, a very down-to-earth fellow, was working in the hall. Happening to glance out of a window, he noticed a figure walking along the edge of the lake. Sidney wondered what she was doing there, and he left the hall to investigate. As he approached her, Sidney could not help but notice her curiously old-fashioned attire, a long grey gown with a white collar and a white cap covering her hair. He inquired. Excuse me, madam, are you looking for somebody? To which she replied. That for which I seek has long since gone. A little bemused by the reply, and rather than stare at the woman, Sidney dropped his head for a moment and when he looked up to speak, again, the woman had gone. But the ghostly tale we are most interested in takes place right here at Blickling Hall itself. Picture the scene, if you will. The date is the 19th of May. It's a dark night here in Norfolk, and you're standing on the main drive that leads up to Blickling Hall. Looking towards the out into Blickling Road, you see a shape coming towards you. And as it draws nearer, you can see it's a carriage and horses. But this is like no other carriage you have ever seen. This carriage is an imposing black creation. It's drawn by a team of headless horses. And sat on the driver's seat, a headless coachman cracks his whip, driving the carriage towards you. The apparition stops and the carriage door opens. Inside the dark interior of the carriage, you can make out a strange blue glow that bathes the figure of a woman sat gracefully on the seat. Her neck is an oozing wound, weeping blood, and clasped in her hands is her severed head, its sightless eyes staring straight ahead. The gruesome figure alights from the carriage and makes its way into the hall, disappearing from your sight. And as you turn back, you can see the carriage fading away into black nothingness.
Now this is how the most travelled ghost chooses to visit us here in Norfolk. And there are many tales of what may be Anne's spirit wandering through the house and its grounds. Sometimes it's the rustle of her clothes as she sweeps past. On other occasions, the figure of a grey lady is seen, dressed in a long grey gown with a white collar, on her head a white cap. She appears as real as anything. And that, my friends, is the end of our tales. Time for us to say good night. And please, don't be too afraid. When the lights go out.